Welcome to our first lecture in Physics 155, Lecture 1. This is our first part. It's Rational and Irrational Numbers. The title of the talk is Strange Things About Irrationals, Revealing the Mysteries of the Reals. So here I have on the left-hand side for you a Venn diagram that gives a flavor of the way the real numbers are structured. The first thing to focus on is the integers, which are represented by the small green circle. It's an infinite set because the integers go from minus infinity to plus infinity, but it has zero weight in the reals. It's what we call a countable inter infinite set because I can count all of the different integers. Next up after the integers are the rational numbers, which are indicated with the yellow ellipse. Those are all the numbers that can be written as p divided by q when p and q are integers. The rationals are closed under arithmetic operations. That means if I take any two rationals and add them together, or I take them and multiply them, or divide them, or subtract them, the answer is a rational number. Any real that isn't rational, we call it irrational. And there are two kinds of irrational numbers. The first kind are called algebraic irrational numbers, and they are the roots of polynomial equations with rational coefficients. And then the second are called transcendental, which is everything else. Now, if you think a little bit carefully, because the algebraic irrational numbers come from polynomial equations with rational coefficients, I can actually count all possible rational coefficients and I can then count all of the roots of those polynomial equations. So the algebraic irrational numbers are actually countably infinite. So in terms of infinity, they actually have the same size as the rational numbers. But the reals are not countable, which means that nearly every real number must be a transcendental irrational number. Even so, it's actually very difficult to prove any number is a transcendental irrational number. So the proof of real numbers that fall into that category is actually very, very small. Some of the familiar numbers that have been proved to be irrational numbers are pi uh, and also e, the uh, number for the natural logarithm, the base of the natural logarithm. Okay, we can, however, show a nice simple proof that irrationals must exist, and it comes from just applying Pythagorean, the Pythagorean theorem to this isosceles right triangle. So, as you remember from the Pythagorean theorem, the square of the hypotenuse, which would be b squared, is equal to the sum of the squares of the legs. So we know that b is the square root of 2a squared, or b is equal to square root of 2 times a. And we're now going to make two observations about the squares of integers. The first one is if we have an even integer and we square it, so if I take 2n and square it, I will get 4n squared. That means the square of an even integer is divisible by 4. On the other hand, if I take the square of an odd integer, 2n plus 1 squared, I get 4n squared plus 4n plus 1. Well, 4n squared is always even, 4 times n is always even, but 1 is odd, so when I add all of those together, I get an odd number. So the square of an odd integer is always odd. So let's take b, and we'll write it as the product of two integers, p times e, and we'll take a, and we'll write it as the product of two integers, q times e, so that a over b is equal to q over p, and q and p have no common factors. This would be called writing the ratio a over b in lowest terms uh, from your old math classes. Now, Pythag the Pythagorean theorem tells us that b squared is equal to 2a squared. That implies, if I look at the ratio a squared over b squared equals q squared over p squared, that ratio must equal 1 half because a squared is 1 half the size of b squared. And if I rearrange that, I find p squared is equal to 2q squared. Now, the only way that p squared can equal 2q squared is that p is even, because we've just shown that the square of p is an even number, and only even numbers square to even numbers. 
Hence, p must be even. So we can write p equals 2n. Now when I square p, I get 4n squared equals 2q squared. I can cancel a 2 from both sides, and I'm left with 2n squared equals q squared. That means q squared is an even number because it's 2 times n squared. So both p and q are even, implying I can write q equals 2m. Now this means that both p and q have 2 as a common factor. But we assumed at the beginning there were no common factors in p and q. So the only way that this can hold is that a over b cannot be written as p over q. It must be an irrational number. So this is the way that you can show that irrational numbers actually exist. There are numbers that cannot be written as p over q, where p and q are both integers. Our next step is going to be looking at what happens when we raise numbers to powers, because they tend to do odd things. So we can take the rational numbers and create algebraic irrational numbers by raising a rational number to a rational power. We just gave an example of that. 2 raised to the 1 half power, where both 2 and 1 half are rational numbers, is equal to the square root of 2. And we just proved that that's equal to an irrational number. So the rational numbers, while they're closed under arithmetic operations, they are not closed under powers. Odder still, we can take an algebraic irrational number, raise it to an algebraic irrational power, and the result is a rational number. So the way that we prove that this can occur is by constructing an explicit example. So let's start with the number square root of 3, which is an algebraic irrational number, and let's raise it to the square root of 2 power, which is also an algebraic irrational number, and let's call that number x. So x is the square root of 3 raised to the square root of 2 power. The next thing we do is we take x and we raise it to the square root of 2 power. So if I go through the math for that, I write x as square root of 3 raised to the square root of 2, and then take the whole thing and raise that to the square root of 2 power. Then by using the law of how I raise things to a power, that whole thing is square root of 3 raised to the square root of 2 times square root of 2 power. But square root of 2 times square root of 2 is just equal to 2. So that whole thing will equal square root of 3 squared, which is, of course, just equal to 3. Okay, so now pay attention. This part is a little tricky. Either x is irrational, and then we just showed if I take x and I raise it to the square root of 2, I get 3, which is a rational number. So that would have shown that x, an irrational number raised to the square root of 2, is a rational number, which is what we've been trying to prove. Either that's true, or x is rational. Well, if x is a rational number, that means square root of 2 raised to the square root of 2 power is a rational number. So once again, that would show that taking an irrational number and raising it to an irrational power gives a rational number. Either way, we have found a, an example where raising an irrational number to an irrational power will yield a rational number. What we don't know is which one is the rational number. We don't know whether square root of 3 raised to the square root of 2 power is rational, or whether that number, which, is an ir which could be an irrational number, raised to the square root of 2 power is the one that is rational. We don't know which one is, is correct.